Well, hello everyone and welcome to our Baking with Ancient Grain series that we're going to be doing um, during the month of March. And I'm Denise Smith. I'm the University of Wyoming Extension Food and Nutrition Educator for um, Niobrara County. And today we have a guest with us who is Caitlin Youngquist. She is the UW Extension Ag Educator from Washakie County up in Worland. And she's gonna start us out on talking about the Ancient Grains Project that the University of Wyoming um, is involved in. So Caitlin, we'll let you get started and you can tell us all about the project. Well, thank you, Denise. It's really fun to join you today. So thank you for the invitation. I'm gonna share just a little bit about the ancient grains really briefly that we're working with here. And also a, a little bit of fun Wyoming history that you may not have known. So these are the grains that we're work that we're working with. Um, we are working with einkorn, emmer, and spelt. And einkorn being the oldest domesticated grain that we know of, um, followed by emmer was the next domestication, and then spelt, which is very similar to modern wheat, and then of course our modern wheat varieties. You will sometimes hear these referred to as the ancient grains, although there are other grains that also get lumped in with the ancient grains, millet sometimes, and quinoa and various things. Um, there is modern wheat varieties, and then you'll also hear sometimes about heritage wheat, which are some of the earliest domesticated wheats. They're not really an ancient grain, but they're more of a heritage wheat variety, and there are um, various uses for that and flavor benefits and nutritional benefits is that for that as well. But we're going to focus today on the einkorn, emmer, and spelt. So as I mentioned, the einkorn was the first uh, domesticated grain about 4,000 to 10,000 uh, uh, BCE in the Tigris Euphrates region. What's interesting is it's a diploid, which means it has, which means it has two chromosomes, and it's very challenging to grow and bake with, but it has outstanding flavor and nutritional profiles, and a lot of people say that if they can't eat wheat, they can often eat einkorn or emmer. Um, it was then replaced by barley and emmer later. Um, einkorn was outcrossed with another grass and picked up a second set of chromosomes, which gives it more genetic diversity, which means it can thrive in a wider range of conditions. It's also a little bit easier to bake with. The gluten in it is a little bit stronger than einkorn. And then spelt was the next domesticated grain moving towards wheat, more crop development and cultivar selection over the years. It picked up another set of chromosomes to make it a hexaploid, the same as modern wheat. And as a result, it's the most common, um, easiest to bake with, easiest to grow, has the widest genetic variability that allows it to thrive in a wide range of conditions. So that's a little bit about the steps of development from einkorn to emmer and to spelt. It's really important to note that they are not gluten-free grains, but many people who say they um, are sensitive to gluten or cannot digest wheat are able to digest some of these older grains. And it may have something to do um, with the fact that, they are, that, this, that the gluten in it is not as strong, or there may be other factors as well. It, they're lower in phytic acid, which, is a, which um, can limit our ability to uptake mineral nutrients. And they're lower, um, they have less, Inflammatory cytokines is what some of the research, research shows. And so for people who are sensitive to gluten, that may, may help. Higher in protein, typically, more of some of our micronutrients and more vitamin D. So they're really interesting. We're learning a lot about them as we learn to grow them and cook with them across the state. And there are some difference in flavors and of course nutrition, and they may fit really well into our um, farm rotations here in Wyoming and give Wyoming farmers another crop to grow. This picture is from the National Magazine in 1912, 1911 and 1912. The new improved winter emmer yielding 90 bushels per acre grown by Professor Buffum in Warland, Wyoming. Professor Buffum was a, was a professor, a researcher and professor at the Wyoming College before it was University of Wyoming. And then um, really uh, was very interested in this winter emmer and was um, interested in developing it as a variety that would thrive in Wyoming and be a high nutritional product and something that could be used here. This is a picture of the Omaha Land Show in 1911. 
where he um, was displaying some of his improved winter products, the grain breeding by BC Buffum, um, arid agriculture. He was really promoting emmer as a crop that should be grown in Wyoming. And this is a, a picture of the Emmer Products Company factory in Worland, Wyoming, and the Worland Grit. These articles from, are from about 1915 in the Worland Grit newspaper. The Emmer factory is ready to start. And then there's an ad first on the market for Emmer breakfast food sold um, by the Emmer Products Company out of Worland. So just an interesting little bit of Wyoming history that I thought you guys might find interesting as you're learning about cooking with some of these older grains. So I'll turn it back over to you, D Denise, if there's anything I, I would like me to share. Okay. Well, I think that's a really good background. And um, just a little note, Caitlin will be joining us each week um, with a little bit more about the project and what they're doing at UW um, with these grains to try to get them out into um, use by the general public and by industry. So we'll also be baking a different recipe each and every week. So we're gonna start today by kind of showing you, um, Caitlin showed you what it looks like when it's, when it's growing, well, as it's grown. And now we're gonna show you after it's been harvested, kind of the difference between what, um, we have hard white winter wheat berries and what that flower looks like, um, some spelt and some emmer. And so Aaron's going to bring the camera up and Caitlin just chime in whenever. Um, Caitlin's the expert on growing and the agriculture part. Um, we're the test kitchen here. So we've been doing a lot of testing of different things Two weeks ago, we baked bread and made pretzels, which are two of the recipes that we'll be doing during this series with our 4-H kits. And um, they turned out really well. And so we, we'll talk about those um, during those weeks. But so Erin, if you want to bring your camera up, um, right here, this first little bowl is our hard white winter wheat, and it's kind of light in color. Um, the kernels are a little longer and more slender than as we go. This is the whole wheat flour, and it's, it's very um, pretty pale, not much darker than um, white flour is. So we, we do a lot of baking with just wheat flour. And then the next bowl is our spelt. And it's a little darker in color. It's still elongated and maybe even a little um, thinner than the winter white wheat. So, um, and really you can't tell much difference in the flour. And I don't know if you can really see it's a little bit darker than the um, just whole wheat flour, but still pretty pale. And um, we found it bakes really, really well. Our last bowl here is the emmer and it's darker in color and its kernels are plumper mm -hmm. and um, I think all the spelt and the emmer were both grown in Washakie County. Is that correct, Caitlin? Uh, not in Washakie County, but they were grown in Wyoming. Wyoming, okay. So there are farmers growing this currently. And um, so we're hoping that we can figure out some really good recipes for, um, for people to use. And here's the emmer flour. And as you can see, it's much darker. And I want to say maybe a little coarser. That was my experience too with milling my own emmer flour is it did have a different texture. And I was worried about the texture once I cooked with it, but it seemed to be fine once it was baked. It just had, did have a coarser texture though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we did grind them all. Um, we have a, I think it's a wonder mill and we ground them all on 
bread flour setting. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting that they came out looking a little bit different. Yeah, so, I've been feeding my sourdough with spelt and emmer and kind of off alternating. And I made some sourdough pancakes with emmer the other day that were very good. So I would encourage people if they were interested in some of these grains to experiment a little bit. Um, if you're in the Warland area um, or coming through the Warland area, I have a little bit and some that I can share just to give you a few pounds of flour, um, but we don't have any through the Wyoming First Grains project available yet for retail. But if you're coming through the Warland area, let me know and I'll, I'll hook you up. And if you're ever, I mean, around Lusk, we do have some grain here that Caitlin has shared with us and you could sure come look and we could give you some or grind you up a little and you could try it at home as well. So I thought we'd start out a little. I did grind some spelt flour this morning, but just for those of you who haven't ever seen um, how it works, we'll just grind just a smidgen right now. So ours, as Aaron says, is a wonder mill and um, you always have to go top the pan. It is very noisy, so we can't talk and do this, but we'll just run just a smidgen so you can see it. You always have to turn it on before you put the um, kernels in so that it doesn't get just clogged up in there. So we'll turn it on. And it goes really, really quickly. And we have to admit the kids love to grind their own flour. So. And grinding our own flour and using it, you, I've kind of gotten addicted to the, the freshness of that fresh ground flour versus um, store-bought that's drier and just has a different smell. So this it's so much better. Flour, I love that fresh ground flour. Yeah. This amount of flour came from one cup of spelt. So it, it really was well, not one measuring no. cup, one Pepsi cup. <laughs> I can tell this came from Moreland because it came with a Pepsi cup in the, <laughs> in the bag of grain I got. So so what we're gonna do is today we're making a oatmeal chocolate chip cake. And this is one of my favorite recipes. I make it a lot at home and it's the perfect cake to um, travel with because you don't, it's not gonna have frosting. And so it transports really easily and people really love it. It also has some extra health benefits because it does have oatmeal and now it's going to have the whole grain flour. So you're getting a lot of extra fiber and it also has nuts, which will give you some protein. And it also has a really good dose of chocolate, which is my favorite part. And um, there's nothing better in my book than chocolate cake. So what I did while Caitlin was talking, we start out our recipe by a cup of oatmeal and it can either be old-fashioned or quick cooking oatmeal and then you have to put a cup and three quarters boiling water on the oatmeal and let it sit for 10 minutes so i've done that our 10 minutes is just up and at this point we are going to add uh, one cup of brown sugar one cup of white sugar So we'll put the white sugar in. Um, and the brown sugar. And again, for those of you who don't remember about measuring brown sugar, it is important that you take your cup and you pack it in very firmly. You want that brown sugar to hold its shape when you dump it um, out of the cup 
so that you know you've got the right amount. And I always use for this recipe, light brown sugar rather than the dark brown sugar. The dark brown sugar has a little um, stronger flavor because it has more molasses in it. So I like the light brown sugar flavor better. I'm kind of making a mess today. The next thing we're going to add after we get our brown sugar in is a cube of either butter or margarine. And we're using real butter today. And you want to put, you can see that it held its shape. Now we're going to put the butter in. And you want to stir this until your butter is melted. And your oats are still very hot from that boiling water, so it doesn't take long to melt the butter. As I said, this transport's really easy because it's kind of a heavier cake and it, um, I don't know if in your part of the world, um, you do a lot of funeral dinners. It seems like I'm always having to bring a cake in for a funeral dinner into town. And so this one transports really well. Okay, we've about got our, butter melted. So to this mixture, we're going to add our two eggs and beat those in. Come on, butter. Last little pieces of butter don't want to melt today. So over the next um, month, we're going to be doing some other fun recipes. Like I said, we'll be doing a no need yeast bread, some soft pretzels, uh, scones. And what's our fifth one? Ooh, scones, that sounds good. So um, I'm sure we'll figure out how to incorporate some chocolate into those as well. <laughs> I'll have to think a minute what our fifth recipe is. Is it the pretzel? Did you say pretzels? I did say pretzels. So um, we're going to put one egg in at a time. Make sure that it looks good. And always break your egg over a separate bowl so in case it isn't a good egg, you don't want to dump it directly into your um, cake batter or whatever you're baking so that it um, would ruin whatever you're baking. So Denise, is this recipe typically done with a white flour? Yes, and oat? Tip typically it calls for a cup and three quarters of white flour. So today we're using a cup of spelt and three quarters cup of the white flour. Oh, okay. um, usually for these kind of recipes, I don't like to use total um, whole grain flour because oftentimes they don't rise as nice as if you have a little white flour in there to do the rising because mm -hmm. it's a little heavier. But um, so it's, it's worked well, just kind of half and half. So we're gonna start out with unsifted flour and we're gonna sift our two flours together and our um, other dry ingredients. So when we're measuring our flour, we do wanna measure it just really, so it goes into your cup lightly, don't pack it in there or you're gonna get way too much. 
So, and then just use the back of a knife, the level part and level this off. So this is our spelt flour. And then we're going to use three quarters of a cup of white flour. And when we did our bread the other day and our pretzels, we did half and half, um, half emmer or half spelt or half whole wheat and half white. Again, it helps with the rising of your product. Okay, that's our white flour. Now we're going to have a teaspoon of baking powder. And this again will help with the cake to rise nicely. A tablespoon of cocoa, cocoa powder. And it is important that you sift all this together so it does distribute um, the flavors and the leavening throughout your batter and then a half a teaspoon of salt. And never measure over your bowl or your sifter, because I would have just gotten way more than a half a teaspoon. I'm learning all sorts of great tricks by watching, Denise. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the other a better baker. Is, well, no. A few things I think I baked pretty well, but I, I can always improve. The other thing, if you don't normally use a sifter and, and you're going to try it out for the first time, um, never ever wash your sifter. Um, just wipe it out with maybe not even hardly a damp cloth. And because once you get this wet, it rusts or it clogs up this little screen in the bottom and you'll never sift again. So just kind of, I always put it over like the waste basket or something, kind of pound out what's left and then just wipe it off. So now we have our good mixture of our flowers and other dry ingredients. And we're going to spoon that in very lightly because you've just put all that air into it by sifting and you don't want to plop it in there in one giant heap and take all your air out. And having the air incorporated in by the sifter will also help um, the cake to rise nicely. This is a recipe that I probably baked for over 40 years and it has never failed so that's a really good thing because sometimes you you see a good recipe and you try it and it really doesn't turn out that well we've all had the pinterest fails um <laughs> that turn into um nothing quite like the recipe looks like the other thing is while you're stirring this, you want to stir it again pretty lightly and, and not just whip all the air back out of it. And the beauty of, of this cake with the whole wheat flour, it's already kind of got a brown honey color. So with the whole wheat, um, you're not going to notice a color change. If you were doing a white cake, you wouldn't want to use probably the whole wheat flour because it will change the appearance um, of your cake. Say so once all of that is folded in, we're going to use a package of 12 ounces of semi-sweet chocolate chips. So we're going to put about half of those roughly into our batter. And again, stirring gently. And then we're going to use a nine by 13 inch pan lightly. Hopefully. 
since I just broke the top off of it. Um, spritz our bottom a little so it doesn't stick. And now we're going to pour that in there gently. And sometimes I can be kind of messy, so. And then to finish off our cake, We're going to top it off with um, the rest of the chocolate chips, which will then substitute for our frosting. And then three quarters of a cup of chopped, and we're using walnuts today. You could also use chopped pecans if you would rather have pecans. Sometimes the price dictates what you're going to use. I, I, priced pecans this morning and walnuts and decided walnuts were, um, were what we were going to use. And you try to sprinkle these on evenly over the cake and it will bake at 350 for 40 minutes. And then um, Aaron will post a picture of our completed baked cake when it gets done. So you can go back onto Facebook and, and check out the finished product. And Caitlin, this is the downfall to you zooming in from your office is you don't get to enjoy afternoon snack with us. I know, I was just thinking, what, what the heck, I should have done one here. <laughs> I was wondering actually, Diana, I, I wonder if this um, recipe would lend itself to um, if someone was interested in gluten-free product with the oats in there, you could put in something like a gluten-free baking mix for the flour, perhaps. If a person was interested in that, would that work, do you think? I, and I do not have enough experience with the gluten-free um, stuff like that to know if, how well that would work in here. I'd say it'd be worth um, a try because you can't, I mean, even if it didn't rise, it probably would taste really well. Um, I'm just not really good at that gluten-free. I just noticed there's growing interest. I've, I've just heard growing interest in that in kind of gluten-free yes. eating. And so I was just curious, but it seems like it would lend itself well to trying anyway. I think it would, and um, I, I am glad to learn, even though I've read some of this, it's always good to hear somebody else talk um, that these are a little lower in gluten and, and seem to help people with gluten intolerance mm -hmm. if you're baking with some of these. So there's our finished um, cake, what it looks like unbaked. It's beautiful. We'll bake it for 40 minutes. And again, this is one you'll probably want to use a toothpick to check the doneness because it is pretty dense. And so you want to make sure that you're done completely through. Make sure your toothpick comes out clean when you insert it in the center. And as Aaron said, in probably an hour and a half, we're going to eat some of this for afternoon snacks. So but we'll be sure to take a picture before we um, um, cut into it. So we'd like to thank everybody for joining us. This will be posted on the Facebook page, Nutrition and Food Safety Facebook page. It will also be posted on YouTube. So if you do wanna go back and watch it again and the recipe will be posted as well. So- Well, thank you, Denise, week, for inviting well, me to- and I look forward to the rest of the um, Ancient Grain series this month and learning a few more fun recipes. 
Well, very good. And we'd like to thank you for joining us and um, on the agriculture side of this whole project. So thanks. And we will see everybody next Tuesday at 1.30. Until then.